We good to roll? We are good to roll. Okay. Um, where's my papers? Next to Mark, I think it's grab out. Get those. Any new discussion, Mary? Okay. We're going to call to order the meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees Property Subcommittee meeting. I'm Rick, Dr. Andy, Mr. K. Lane, James, Melanie, Tim, Mark. Mark, Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Tim are all present. Um, all right, so we're trying to decide how to move forward with our burnt down building and uh, we've gathered some funds, had donations, and actively seeking grant money and uh, other things. Um, are you able to share any information yet? Sure. So, for the, the committee's sake, I just want to kind of review where we are with insurance, some of the grants that Mr. Quadro just mentioned. Uh, part of the the homework assignment from last subcommittee uh, was for Crystal and I to reach out to the city. Uh, I will share those updates as well for the committee. To kind of give us an overview of where we stand currently with the finances. Uh, so the initial insurance settlement offer from the insurance company uh, was approximately $900,000. And uh, I know Tim reached, uh, pushed back through the city, back through the insurance company to, to advocate that that was not enough uh, based on current construction costs uh, and I know there's some discussions there, but initially we're looking at approximately $900,000 for the building insurance claim. Uh, please keep in mind that's not, we can't apply that entire $900,000 towards the building because some of that was for the architect, uh, that was for uh, permitting, the demo, so on and so forth. So there's been other costs that we have already incurred that we will have to incur that will eat into that $900,000. Uh, so just keep that in mind. We do have two grants, uh, one that uh, I want to thank Ms. Shardy and Mr. Bianca for submitting. Uh, that was a skills capital grant. We were able to apply for two programs. Uh, we applied for horticulture for obvious reasons along with animal science. The idea behind that particular grant, uh, just so you know, I've been invited as a model president to attend the skills capital grant announcement next week. Fingers crossed that there'll be some good news coming out of that for Smith. Uh, Nothing is, is public at this point, but I'll be there no matter what. Uh, the idea behind that particular grant was 30% of the grant can be applied to capital improvements. That would equate, based on our, our grant application, we could apply it up to $600,000 towards capital improvements. Please keep in mind that before the fire, uh, our vision was to expand animal science, to begin to introduce companion animals, eventually vet assisting, eventually before the fire, I was going to be prepared to stand in front of the board and ask that we dip into tuition revolving uh, to use tuition revolving money for those necessary renovations, such as the former Greenfield Community College building. In talking to the state after the fire, uh, the state told me about this grant that was coming out, uh, the one that we just submitted, the one I will be attending as, as the president next week to hear if we receive anything. Uh, in essence, it was a shell game. So, if we do receive this grant, it would allow us to use $600,000 from that grant, the grant says for animal science. But the idea is if we can use it towards animal science for grant money, that would free up the tuition revolving money that I would then advocate that we apply to the horticulture rebuilding. That makes sense, it's simply a shell game. Uh, so I, ideally we have approximately $600,000 for this grant. We'll know more next week. The second grant that I will be asking for permission from the board this evening uh, to apply for is a larger skills capital grant, uh, upwards of $5 million. Uh, this grant is due next, next month, so I will be standing in front of the board tonight asking permission to submit an application for it. The difference here is for that $5 million, you can apply up to four programs uh, rather, than, rather than the two. The other big change is 70% of that grant can be applied to capital improvement. So if we are able to submit a grant of $5 million, $3.5 million could be applied towards capital improvement. We've had some initial conversations, me being Mr. Bianca and Mr. Chartier, 
uh, myself, we met with the four department heads that we would like to focus on for this grant, horticulture once again, um, obviously for, for obvious reasons. We're also looking at ag mechanics, cabinet making, advanced manufacturing. Uh, between those four programs, if we can find $1.5 million worth of equipment, we can do the $5 million grant use three and a half million for uh, the horticulture grant. So that's where we are with sort of hopefully some good numbers, uh, some positive news, uh, just so the subcommittee is aware. Uh, the skills capital grants, when they come out, they always publish a list of priority industries that they want to support through the skills capital grants. And uh, you know, so internally as the admin, you know, we look at that list, we look at the Chapter 74 programs that we have, and we try to earmark which programs would satisfy those high needs areas. Unfortunately, over the years, horticulture typically doesn't make that list. Uh, we were lucky enough this past round, I'm hoping, uh, because people have pity on us, that perhaps we'll receive some good news on the grant that we'll find out next week. Uh, but horticulture does appear on the bigger grants list as a top need, so I kind of curious why that all of a sudden appears on the list. So my fingers are crossed that if we are able to get permission tonight from the board, we are able to submit the grant, I'm guessing that grant would be announced sometime in December before the governor leaves office. Um, so let's assume for a second between insurance, let's assume for a second we receive the grant, we'll find out next week. Let's assume for a second we receive the larger grant. We're talking ballpark somewhere in that 4.8, 4.9 million dollar range between those three funding sources. That's not using the entire 900,000 for the insurance. That's being a little bit more conservative, but we can't spend all of that. So, with that said, last property subcommittee, uh, I was asked, uh, along with Ms. Fairman, to reach out to the city, see if the city would have an appetite to take out a bond to help us fund this particular project. Uh, so we did. Uh, we met with uh, the mayor, we met with the finance director, and uh, it was a very professional, courteous meeting of nothing. Uh, it was a great meeting, honestly. The big takeaway was uh, the city would be receptive to taking out a bond if they were allowed to use that bond payment as the net school spending contribution figure. Just for the property subcommittee, that would be against state regulations. Uh, there's a cap on what municipalities can, can use or capital improvements towards net school spending. Uh, for those who are unaware, that's just ethically, uh, we are here to teach children. And if the entire city's contribution in any city or town was used to build a building, there would be no operating budget to teach the kids in that building. Uh, so they cap how much money can be applied uh, to capital improvements. The city would want a waiver from the state. Uh, so in essence, all of the money would be applied to the bond. Uh, there would be no money for the, from the city towards the operating budget, and there would be no, no option for other capital improvement projects uh, like we've had in the past. Uh, so that was the meeting. That was the takeaway from the city. That led Ms. Fairman and I to have a meeting with the Department of Ed and the Finance Department, uh, the director in the office, along with his understudy. Another great meeting. Uh, in essence, they told us, uh, thanks but no thanks, they would not issue the waiver. Um, so that's off the table. Uh, there is no option for us to get a waiver for the net school spending figure. Uh, what they were pushing was uh, for us to pursue the non-resident capital assessment, uh, which is it's a regulation. It's very clear cut. We would be eligible for it. Uh, Minute Maid. Excuse me, Andy. Who's pushing? The state or the city? The state would be pushing us. Okay. They feel that that's our best option. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what the non-resident capital assessment regulation states, uh, this was put on the books at the state level because of the new Minuteman uh, down in Lexington. In essence, if we, we are a school with a large percentage of non-resident students, if we have a large capital project, such as a building project in, in horticulture, we could actually take the annual payment that we have for a bond for that particular project we divide that annual cost by the number of non-resident students that we have at particular year, and we come up with a per student assessment. That assessment could be applied to the non-resident tuition, and that bill would go to all of the sending districts. Um, if I can speak frankly, uh, that may not be a wise decision 
uh, for us at this particular time. Uh, just the political environment, uh, we have a lot of small towns that feed into us. A lot of those small towns already are concerned about a tuition payment. Uh, there's some heated discussions at town meetings around students attending Smith because of the tuition. On top of the tuition they have their transportation costs. And then all of a sudden if we're gonna, if we have the right to, this would be a board vote. Uh, on top of all of that, we would then assess a capital assessment to them. Uh, it could be difficult. And I would just want to caution the board uh, that this, this particular project supports one Chapter 74 program, technically. Some of these towns are sending students to Smith for programs outside of horticulture, but those towns would still be charged at capital assessment. Uh, so again, I, I'm not sure politically it's the right move, honestly. Uh, I think that's that regulation I have shared in the past, we would definitely have to pursue if and when we ever discuss a new D-building. Uh, that's a bigger impact. This particular project, I know I might be saying, tabling some potential money, but I think there's bigger consequences if we pursue that for this but I just share, that's my personal opinion. I share that with the subcommittee for bigger discussion. That would be a board vote. Uh, but back to insurance, potential two skills capital grants. That's getting us to that 4.8 to 5 million range, somewhere in that range. Uh, please keep in mind, we haven't received a settlement offer for our, our lost equipment. The great thing there is that whatever settlement we get from the lost equipment, uh, we can use that money towards the building reconstruction. That's why I think I'm comfortable to say we probably could push between that along with the, the donations that we've received. We're probably in that $5 million range. You know, we could take some of that equipment insurance settlement away from equipment replacement because the community has been generous in donating a lot of the tools that we've lost. Uh, a lot of the equipment that we've lost, a lot of the equipment we haven't lost, uh, potentially we might be able to get through the grant process we've been talking about. So, there are ways to get the equipment back and the tools back without using the insurance money, which allows the insurance money to be used for the building. So, what is, what is the dollar amount that we yeah. are sitting in Attica right now? The, that was donated to uh, I have in my report tonight. Okay. I want to say when I looked this morning, it's somewhere around. The caveat is this is, well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you $36,000. Yeah. Okay. The $36,000, though, is not all cash. Right. That's cash and gift cards. Right. So, the gift cards we can't use towards the building, but. Mr. Nevin can use to buy some more tools. Uh, and what's the potential um, equipment settlement dollar figure? We're still waiting for that from, that so the maximum here? was 234000 max. Max. Correct. What's your gut telling you? <laughs> well, I'm looking at what, what they're giving us for a replacement value, so I'm not really sure. Um, okay. I just, and I, the reason why I was late, I was talking to Joe Cook about the about the uh, the insurance. So aren't um, they supposed to replace something new, not not prorate it? So and that's exactly what I said to him. And I said, Joe, the numbers um, that we're discussing um, are not reflective of what it costs to rebuild right now. And he said, Well, the prices that we've looked at that were sent to him what what were based on building a brand new school. And I said, No. I said the problem is is if we have to bring that building back to where it was, insurance isn't giving us enough money. Not today. So um, Joe said that he, was he knows you sent those documents. He can't find them. If you could resend it, he would appreciate it. So he asked for some, I, I said $675 a square foot to rebuild. And then uh, the insurance company wants some from Deeds, their estimator, who said 600 to $650 a square foot. That's what I sent to Joe. And then it was a little back and forth that that number was to build a real high school. And I said, well, it doesn't matter what you do in the building, but the walls still cost the same amount to build it. You know, your building materials the same. And each knows what we're building for, so they they know what the use is. So. And I thought at one point Kevin felt uh, with type of what we trying to do there was consider well not considerably, but less than six seventy five more in the. Four hundred, five hundred dollar range. Yeah. I, I think in a number of three eighty five for some reason per square foot. But his estimator sent us the other one, six to six. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's so what we, we got to plead our case yeah. at the high end as best we can. Obviously, right. uh, what was that figure again? Crystal two thirty four for the two thirty four. Yes. Okay. 
All so right. Joe Cook would like Tim to follow back up with him. All right. So okay. Tim sent him some stuff. He can't now find it, so you're going to resend it. Okay. Um, and then um, Mr. Kaling, you maybe want to comment on the meeting with McGovern's office on Friday? Um, I had the opportunity to reach out to uh, Congressman McGovern's office, and he sent his representative um, to that meeting that Andy, Mr. Carter, and myself attended. Um, and his name is Kobe Gardner Levine. And um, first of all, I was a little concerned because he's an aide or a rep or whatever. And I, I attended a lot of meetings over the years and usually there isn't much interaction. Let me just see what I can do. I'll gather this paperwork and, and leave. This guy lit right up at the table and said, no. He said, I think we'd help you. He said, we got agriculture grants. We got things that we can apply for. I'm not promising anything, but there's an opportunity here because, and that's why I reached out because um, Congress and government every year marches in the food bank march with the local guy from uh, the River Radio Station, Monte Belmonte, and they walk from Springfield to Northampton and then from Northampton up to Greenfield raising money all the way along the way and McGovern walks that whole thing with him. So I reached out to Monty and said, just, you know, tell him that we build all your carts for that march and all that. He has recognized, McGovern has recognized Smith Vocational on the house floor of the Capitol. Uh, so he knows who we are. And so anyways, his representative uh, was very receptive in regards to seeing what he can go back and put together for us. <clears throat> the reason I'm looking for the brass ring to try and grab it. It's over and above. Uh, we've got some money sitting there from Joe Comerford from the Senate that is on hold right now, a couple hundred thousand. Uh, and we've got some other uh, monies that I'm working with the House of Representatives uh, also. So uh, we're pulling out all the stops on this thing. Uh, the, the McGovern thing was a reach, uh, but that's where I'm going. That's my job. I'm the PR guy. So, uh, but I came away from that meeting very positive. Uh, so, again, nothing but you, nothing gain, and that's what Mr. Crawford referred to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mr. Kaling, for pulling that together. And yeah, it was a good meeting. He did sound very receptive. And one number of things he offered up for us to look into was uh, potentially USDA road development grants or funds or whatever, Department of Agriculture, even considered Department of Justice. Not sure how that one came out. Um, but the big one was, and he highlighted this, Feds just released the school infrastructure package that he was going to send you info in regards to that, Andy. Did so that happen? I, I did receive it's through the ARPA money now from the state. I, I was just talking to both Mr. Bianca and Ms. Shardy this morning about it uh, in reference to the larger skills grant. And, you know, some initial thoughts that we had, and we might be changing, changing our, our thought process. Uh, the grant that the state just came out with is around uh, HVAC and air handling upgrades. Uh, $100 million, I think it was, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, Depending on the community, uh, you're eligible for a certain amount of money. Uh, so right now, that's how Massachusetts is allocating the money at this early stage. So we are looking into, uh, it doesn't directly impact what we can do with the horticulture building, but it may drive some conversations that we have to have around the largest skills capital grant. That's all I can say at this point. Um, so that's where we're at that particular grant. Okay, I think that uh, pretty much brings us up to date with info that's been generated in the past few weeks. And um, the reality of this $5 million budget seems to be more of a reality. Um, we're getting closer 
We're not there yet, obviously. Um, but whatever. We if I can just throw a couple yeah. minutes out. Um, I would try to advocate that we come to a relatively firm budget number as soon as possible, um, knowing that the building process is going to take a while. Um, and the longer that we wait, hoping for, uh, is longer that Mr. Never is going to be without a shop. Um, so I'm, I would be willing to say I'm advocating that we look at a building project, whatever the scope is, within that $5 million range. And if we are able to receive some of the other funding grants that we talked about the other day, um, great. You know, I think that then it'll be easier for us to, to expand. Uh, we might be able to look at some other improvements on campus. Um, but we're already at the end of September. Um, and I just, I believe the architect who's not here today and we chose to not have him here today because uh, we met in July, we met in August, here in September. Uh, I, I think the architecture firm is waiting for us to come to some type of consensus of what is our sort of budget figure so that he can come up with some, some ideas for us. Um, so with that said, I, I, I fully support what Dr. Andy is saying. I completely agree. Um, let's let's establish that we can shoot for the or let's work towards the five million dollar project and let these architects know that so they can start putting together some conceptual drawings and concepts. Um, and we all do realize that they're they're just here for that and to move on to the to the real project imagine this will have to go out for rfps to, to procurement and that sort of thing and to whatever four or five six architects go ahead <clears throat> what i want to do is i agree with that but i want to use the word tentative in every every description only because I don't want to scare away this potential money that could be out there from the feds, and I don't want to scare away the money that that may come from the state. So I would say tentatively, uh, 4.9 million dollars. You can keep it under five, um, and that way there we have a goal, and that's the way in all our vocabulary and discussions with everybody is this is our goal to try and reach 4.9. And then that way there comes into six million, or comes into a uh, hundred million. Uh, we we've accomplished our goal plus. So I would uh, just if I may say that it's tentative work. I would I totally agree, and, and I think as we start talking about what can we get for that five, four point nine five million we're going to recognize as not everything that we were initially talking about back in July. And we've had some informal, internal conversations about what would that look like, what can we sort of scale back, what can we have as separate, maybe student-driven construction projects to support the program. Uh, and that's where the additional money that may come on, on that, that money tree in the backyard, when we find that money tree, might help us e more easily uh, finish some of those other side projects, not side projects, but sort of those sub-projects that we may have to sort of put on hold or, or construct internally um, but that sort of drove some some conversations internally I just want to put on the, on the table for, for discussion would be um, everything happens for a reason I strongly believe that in life and um, if you had a chance to get down and back I took some pictures I'm going to share this evening but um, Mr. On Mr. Onsbach's classroom Tim and his crew put a fencing around it because now you have the slabs, an elevated slab based on, on the, the slope of the ground. But that former interior wall, the blackboard's still hanging there. I'm still wishing Mr. Onspock could have a birthday. Uh, you can see it from the outside now. Uh, but the point is, I'm like, wow, that would be a beautiful outdoor learning area. Uh, I wish we had this conversation two months ago, to be honest. So what turned, what initially started as sort of this joke. Uh, turn into more of a formal conversation just internally, and I would love to pursue. I'm not the architect, uh, but you know, if we charge Kevin and, and his staff to say, you know, we're, we're looking at that 4.9, 5 million range, what would that look like? You know, but 
how could you design in some outdoor learning areas? Uh, not totally exposed to the weather. I think we have to have some type of pavilion idea, uh, which might be able to incorporate the climbing mechanism that Mr. Ostock and Mr. Nevin is advocating for, I fully support. Uh, but there might be creative ways to rebuild space as non-traditional, typical learning space uh, that might make a lot of sense for your, your program and fit more within that budget rather than the, the $10 million budget we were hoping for originally. So I just, I share that. I'm not sure if anybody on the com committee has some initial thoughts about creative learning spaces. Mark, if you have ideas what you really need. Uh, I think that information, the sooner we can get it back to the architect firm to say, this is what we're looking at for a budget, uh, and, and these are some of the learning areas that we really want to see incorporated, I think it would help the architecture firm. So I just, I share that. I'm not sure if anybody wants to elaborate. I still don't want to lose sight out of our initial meeting that we had here about uh, my disappointment of the non-use of the $100,000 building that gets sitting up there and makes that has over a certain period of time uh, just got looked the other way. Nobody was using it, nobody was going up there, or there was a storage in it. Very disappointing. Uh, I was involved in that building project initially. A lot of volunteer work went into that. Mike Florio brought up cranes, we brought the roofs up. Uh, a lot of effort went into building that building, plus money. And for any business, in, especially in this climate, to have that size of building sitting there vacant is ridiculous. Uh, I know it's a pain in the butt to go from here to there, to take a bus and truck kids up there, uh, to move equipment up there. But it's ours. It's free. It's paid for. It's, you know, why isn't it being utilized? I don't want to, in this master plan of putting this building back together here, lose sight of that. I mean, we've got, winter is going to be moving in here shortly. You need, you know, covered space. I want to talk, as I did with Timmy some already, about water and heat and electricity in that building. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the monies that we're, we're talking about to get you guys back in business as fast as possible. This is great that we're going to patch this up and get it working for you. And I know we have a couple of classrooms around campus to help you as well. But i got to say, we've got to keep our focus on that building up there. That I, I, uh, I want to have somebody, Joe, or if it's you, because I know you picked up the ball quite a bit here in regard to assigning people and, and uh, putting together agendas. You do this and you do that and you do that. I really want you to put that on the top of your list uh, to keep that up front because at every board of directors meeting, you know, board of trustees meeting, uh, I am going to request, as Andy knows, I want to report from 15 departments as well as uh, people that are running our athletics and things like that. What are you doing for me for today? Because we can't have any hidden agendas, we can't have anybody not doing their job. And I'm not accusing anybody of not doing their job. I'm just saying that the magnifying glass is coming out to look at everybody to make sure they're doing their job, including us as board of trustees. Because the departments come in here, they ask for different things, and we're not a rubber stamp operation, as Crystal will tell you, you know. Uh, you know, I've stopped and brought up for discussion and tabled things because I didn't think it was right. It wasn't the right thing at either at the time or spending the money because we are elected officials by the, by the people. And we have to report in regards, just as she does her financial report every month, you give your report, and he gives his report, we're responsible too. And I have the public asking me questions. I can have an answer. In regards to the horticulture building up in the forest, I thought that was a, a great point that was raised when there was last subcommittee meeting the first one we had, obviously. Uh, and, and we have done some initial due diligence, just like Crystal and I reached out to the city for the bond, we reached out to the DESE. Uh, I, the numbers are all sort of jumbled in my head. I think Tim, you can chime in. He has an initial quote for what and how much was it. So this is just a study from Huntley Associates. The, the best way to get electrical and, and water up there he talks about sore, but I would never bring sore. I just do the septic that we always plan. <coughs> and you would just 
give us a, a report and a recommendation, and then what will be the next phase to go after that. So he's he's asking for six thousand for this for this report. They both do this. Do we have like a, an early guesstimate of what it was going to cost us to bring water and electricity up there? Depends if we want the road. If I get what I think, it's okay, so thirty six hundred feet up the road. If you want right up it. So he's he's working at the VA right now. So he's hoping he can find a way through the woods. Sarah Lavalley from the um, from the city said that she didn't think anything was in the woods. I'd have to walk through it and find his wetlands or or something else. She didn't think there was a restriction now. So you can't go that way. Yeah, that's a couple that's of so, running so we've tried to put, <coughs> we tried to put wells in everywhere, and they're half of them, and they come up dry just about oh, everywhere. Okay. Well, I, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean you could definitely try it. It'd be expensive to drill it. Drill yeah. it. I I have to excuse myself, but I agree with you, uh, Mr. Kaley. I think that it's important to know that that building is going to be part of any solution plan for this, as right. part of a, a almost like a portfolio of buildings and things that we do. So we're absolutely. Um, I think when COVID hit and that pulled back anything going up there and doing, obviously that was a hiccup, but moving forward, I wholeheartedly agree that all the space that we have should be utilized and I know that we're going to move forward on that, especially getting heavy machinery and things. If this grant comes through and we have that machinery, I mean, we're going to need that training ground because we finally have the machinery to populate it, so it, it's going to be on the forefront for us. Thank you. And, and the only caution I, I want to throw to you, out there on the table is uh, that becomes a learning space. So there was a, a variance that both well, Mr. Smith and Mr. Kaylin had to go to the state to ask for a variance on that particular building. So it is a glorified shed, uh, which is why there's no power and there's no water. Uh, that was the only way we could get it approved. So as soon as we declare it any, any resemblance of a learning space, we now have to bring it up to code for a learning space, which besides the fact that bringing water, that's why I was asking, you know, water, power, septic, which then means installing bathrooms, which means the lights, which means I'm not sure, a sprinkler system, and there's a lot of issues that we have to address, which I think is part of this subcommittee's work to say, um, how do we use that space better? And we all agree it was underused. Um, and if we're beginning to talk about outdoor learning areas here on campus, why can't we use that space up there? So totally agree. Uh, yeah, my only concern is if we have to put in, I'm throwing numbers out, 800000 to a million dollars to get that building up and running, does that make sense? Maybe we as a team figure that is the most sense. Or right. we as a team say that 800 to a million could be used towards this building project down here. So I just want to put that on the table to say what is the best way to use the funds that we have to make sure we're maximizing the use of our space. Okay. So, I hold on. Can I jump in, please? Yes, um, we're talking about this outdoor learning space. Can we identify that such as an outdoor learning space and not kind of trigger all these other criteria of it being um, educational space and we got to meet all these code criteria? So that's something to look at, I would think. You have any? And finally, my only other, and I see Ms. Chardier chomping at the bit, if I could redefine or not. The only other concern I, I have to put out there uh, is because we have a Chapter 74 program, anytime we have a new learning space, that would be considered a learning space if we put on that road, that means the Department of Ed is coming out for an inspection. Um, so not only are we talking about local building codes and, and whatnot, we're dealing with the Department of Ed. So I would love to have an easy solution. I, I yeah, no, no you're, putting the, you're putting the issues on the table, which we all need to be aware of. Uh, the, the thing I'm going to reiterate is that I've been on the board 12 years. The thing is that a lot of this, that building, goes back on different administration of trustees and things like that. They dropped the ball as well. Um, the thing is that the money that we didn't put into that building over that period of time, 12 years, uh, was, was really should have been budgeted and put in in added things added as we went along and we wouldn't even be having this discussion today so i think we have to look at history as well as today because we're, we're catching up now with that building in regards to adding and adding and adding and adding but monies that were spent and monies that should have been allocated weren't so when you look at it in that that 
view that it's, we're not adding something new here that we just dropped a bomb on it that we're going to do today. It's something that should have been phased in over a period of time. So I want that looked at in that, in that way. So to go back to why it hasn't been utilized, I think Joe hit part of it on the head is um, the getting us able to have permission to use it from the architect because they had to put extra ties in it depths up a little bit and then COVID hit. And we've been doing other projects in the wintertime. We're not hard doing a lot of logging up there. So we're, we haven't been at the wood lot as much as we have been in the past <coughs> you know, doing other projects. But our goal, which we just started doing last year, I started doing with the underclassmen is we're cutting down all those overgrown Christmas trees, clearing it out, we're going to stump it. And as Andy said, we're going to turn that into a heavy equipment operator's training facility and utilize the building for storing the equipment and the chainsaws. And we're going to be able to be up there longer. The only issues we have is um, that's spring fall, but it's not, the ground isn't frozen. And in the, in the wintertime when it is, it's not really a great learning facility to be teaching in, so we wouldn't be out there as much only if we're doing chainsaw work outside. But you know, I think this year, he's already looking at doing clearing a lot for habitat, so it would be more there versus at the woodlot clearing. So the wintertime not be, might not be used as much, and we don't have bathroom facilities. But if we made it more conducive for you. Oh, and then we could absolutely we, use it more. You know, we could just go up there for the day every day. Yeah, That's, but if we can phase in, and Tim and I talked about that, we, you know, if you a class of 12. Right. Uh, the outhouses in regards to temporary could be utilized. Right. Uh, permanent bathrooms and electricity and lighting, we can phase stuff in. Right. And, and like I said, I don't want to, you know, we don't have a million dollars to drop tomorrow, but we can phase things in. And yeah. we utilize it in this project as well to phase that in and make it a viable piece. Right. Because uh, like I said, I I feel that's definitely school property that should be utilized, and everybody now has identified that perfect. Right, and, I, and our plan before the fire hit was to start doing that with the heavy equipment, and we cleared a couple of trees out for new for new climbing up there, and uh, so we wanted to do a number of projects. That was already in the plan. You know, now it, yes, it would have been nice in hindsight if we had it, but. Um, we were moving forward, we're still going to use it whether we get those things. The one thing we do need, though, is bathroom facilities. Sure. Um, because the, we do have a lot more girls in the class now. They're not going to, they don't want to go behind the tree. As soon as we install the bathroom there, it's a learning area. Well, whether it's a porta potty, which we have, and then, so if we got that, I know they don't want to use that either, but we have to provide it. So that, that that would be easier for us to go up there and spend all day up there. What's the feasibility? I'm sorry, I'll stop. I know you've been jumping into that. Oh, sorry. Go for it. Okay. I mean, a porta potty doesn't, doesn't justify bathroom facilities in the eyes of the state. That's, that's not it. So we have to come up with a permanent solution if we're going to ship the kids up there all day. Is it the issue? Once Dave Edmonds comes down, that we're going to be shut down up there. That's not happening. So all of that stuff is simply, we have to be very mindful of what we do and how we do it. That's really it. A thousand percent agree. So my only thought right now until we go through, truly, what are the costs? And if the costs truly Tom. justify it, then I fully would support turning into the space. Until that day happens, um, I think we can use the, we're talking about outdoor learning areas. It's a beautiful outdoor learning area yeah. that we need to better utilize. Um, could us better utilizing the glorified shed for truly storage, would that minimize some of the storage garage space that we need down here, is my point. Could we store more equipment up there than we have been in the past to relieve some of the need for a building down here? That's my question. We could. I think we would have to structure learning and what needs to be used here versus what needs to be used, could be used up there. Uh, we definitely could look at that and minimize um, and utilize that more for storage. We do use it. There's stuff up there now. Um, we brought stuff back from the summertime because we had to use stuff up. We put cycle things through. We like all our landscape <coughs> can go up there in the wintertime, which frees up garage space. So we've been using it for that. but. Um, yeah, we, we at a minimum, that should be on the table. 
Yeah, we can easily use it for, that's easy, and especially if we do get this new equipment, then some of that stuff is going to need to be stored up there um, in the wintertime. Right. But as far as make an accessible road in and out for more utilization, I think that's going to be the number one without spending a lot of money. Well, right, and, and with with the equipment, we, we can go and the, the road up to the cell tower is fine, the road after needs to be fixed. I mean, the cell tower one needs to be needs to be repaired for some yeah. eroding. Um, but that's all stuff that can be done with the students. That was going to be my question. And then I am confused some in regards to this. You say we can use this as outdoor learning space and heavy equipment training. And then how do we get around the need for the bathrooms doing that? The outdoor, in my opinion, that built the structure of the building. Once you enter the four walls of that building, how are we using within the four walls of that building? If it's simply a shed, which is what both you and Mr. Kayleen were able to get the variance on, it's simply a shed. Outside of the shed, when you're driving the equipment up there and grading and whatnot, that's the outdoor learning. Okay, program. yeah. And then we couldn't have a party porta potty there for the tour. We, yeah, we, we used do, to have we do one. have it, but they bring the kids back. Like they bring well, we them back in the middle of the day. Yeah, when you're using it, we put it up there. Right. You can request we, it. Right. All right. Okay. So, if teaching and learning is happening inside that ship, that's the difference. It turns into yeah. the, the, Okay, you're outside. We can have a porta potty there, doing heavy equipment training, doing some logging doing that sort of stuff, yeah. maybe some tree climbing, yeah. whatever. Okay, great. So that's, we're gonna start reutilizing that that's piece of property in that capacity. Meanwhile, we're gonna start brainstorming on all these other things on how to bring it more in line. If we, to put, a, if we put a workbench in that, in that shed because we want the students to do some repairs of the equipment, that's learning space. If we put a smart board in there, that's learning space. If there we seats, put the climbing yeah. wall, <laughs> Is so, learning space. so if we want to repair the equipment inside out of the rain, that's now a learning space. It, are the students learning at that point? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's just my concern. Dave Edmonds catches wind of that. Well, yeah. That, that, that is also part of the what why we wanted the facility is so we can repair it in out of the weather. But this I'm just they can building yeah. this this shed. As you refer to, that's what the state refers to. The state hasn't looked at that thing in 15 years, or or. So we know the state's going to be at once we have this building repaired. Right. The state has to come out and inspect it as new learning space. I know Dave well enough. He's going to say, "Hmm, let's go take a ride up there and look." And last time he was going to go, but he ran out of time. <laughs> so he's aware of it. So oh, it's on his radar. We kept him busy enough that he didn't have time. <laughs> he likes to talk. So. All right. So we're, we're walk, excuse me, walking a fine line. The building was built in some vision, and probably with the vision of funding all these other things through the years, Correct. which never got to happen. Correct. And so shame on what happened in the past. Correct. We're going to change that. There you go. Okay. Like we're on the same page. All right, I think we should move on from this. All right. Um, okay, so where are we at? Um, we, we've kind of established a tentative budget of 4.9. Right. Who's going to notify Kevin and Dietz? Is that you or Tim? And start the process of what can we do? What we want to yeah, well, we'll okay. And um, target what? A couple weeks from today for a meeting, or is that that enough time you think, Tim? Or should we, well, well, why don't you see what Kevin says? Why don't you yeah. throw out two weeks? Okay. So either the first or second week of October then? Uh, anybody one. chime in here? Does that work? Do it again on Tuesday. Yeah, two days. Could I ask a question? Yeah. So within that two weeks' time or three weeks' time, 
are you or somebody, Joe, going to accumulate just a small list of absolute necessities that we need to have in that building as he's trimming it down from whatever it was to 4.9 million? I would, I agree with you. I would recommend that that list be given to Kevin before the meeting. Give him a week or two to turn around and give us an option. You know, I, I just feel spinning, spinning the wheels is wasting time, so. Totally agree, and, and, and I thought that kind of was being generated through this whole process. Um, it has been, but not to the point of, okay, we're, we're looking at that five million range. All right, now, now we've established a dollar figure, okay? So now we have some reality. So now okay. we have absolute necessity that have to be Agreed. included, and then we can add on extras if there's Correct. more money left. Somebody. Agreed. Just didn't have so my only question is, say, totally hypothetical, if we need additional funding that we don't have to get the building where we need it, at that point will we think about going to the city to say, okay, hey, we need a $500,000 or a million dollar bond and then figure out a way to pay for it? I'm just asking because, you know, with, with, the, way, an option. with the way prices are right now, I just... Well, we don't want to... We don't want to Screw up this nope. Nope. No, 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 problem. no, but that would be, that's what I'm saying. Right. When we look at it, okay, then that would be something that we have to repay. Right. That we would repay. Right. Well, the state already said no, and then is the city going to push back and say, no, you're SOL? No, 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 no not using right. it, not using it to count towards net school spending. No. But look at, look at the way we would. Just borrow the one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we can take it to Okay. Okay. So, right. okay. Okay. And what is that a month? Twenty? It's about twenty six hundred a month. Twenty six hundred? Correct. So how quickly just did Evan? Another one more seven. Those pressing need like that what at the end of the day do we absolutely positively need to have in the building? How long would it take to well, would you still want the additional animal science classrooms? But see, that's probably what I would cut first. We were just talking. I mean, I, I would say at least three. I mean, I could probably get, I'd have to talk to Jim early as maybe Friday. But when they start, and if animal science goes down there, right. they start the companion animal, they're going to need a classroom, and then the next year they're going to need two classrooms. Right. Okay. So, so you're already short, you know. You know, well, I, I, I know, um, and I was just doing, looking at a few numbers with the 4.9 million. I remember him saying 450 dollars that would give us just over 10,800 square feet, and I think they used 8,000. I, I think was on the initial 8,000 square feet, so that would give us like two, maybe three class extra without changing anything else. So I didn't. I think then that goes into what we need to look at. What we, how much space we need, and I think I know we were expanding storage and headhouse space and some other stuff, so that might affect that total amount. So I think that's something that I have to look at, what we really need and can live without. And keep in mind outdoor space and some other things too, so. Um, so there's two, two a we between now and the rest of the week, maybe spilling over to really next week. Can we internally have some of these discussions and uh, you know, share out by three you? So if we could have sort of that true priority list by the end of this week, early next week, that is shared with Kevin. Uh, so we're talking no sooner than Tuesday, October 4th, and I'm thinking more realistically, Tuesday, October 11th at 3 p.m. And you, yes, I, I, I would agree with you. My only response would be, I would think the 11th would make a lot of sense. However, projecting out the following week is the October board meeting. The, the 18th? So we double up again. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, to me, it makes sense because of my schedule. I don't have a problem with that. Let's what about the others? I would prefer that. My vote counts. So October 18th would be the next probably. So I think that would give time internally to have a priority list 
give time for Kevin and his staff to come up with some decent ideas. But so when's the deadline for giving them the absolute spaces? A week from today. Give us a week internally okay. to say what we need to space. So Tuesday the 27th? Okay. No later than Wednesday morning the 28th, get them info? Yep. And then that would give him, um, looks like two and a half two weeks. Two and a half weeks. weeks. Okay, anybody got any other topics for discussion regarding? Um, if I can just circle back to Tim, you said a little while ago about the research into the forest building. Yep. What are those next steps to get some of those answers? Um, I just, we just signed an agreement with him. He just does send his guys up there. So, so there's been talk of a generator. If you want to do a well, that's going to be completely different than what Mike is going to be looking at. He's going to try to figure out how to get water up there from the city and how to maybe get through a, a quicker path. I don't see how we tell me you, you may know Dave more than I do. Would the generator pass muster, or is he going to say the generator's not going to come? I would say no. But that's my fear as well. Pretty by the book. I would want to at least be prepared to say we need to have true power, yeah. water, and... Well, if I could answer it, I think that just like we use this for a shelter, it's an emergency use only. I think if you go at it with a generator, emergency use only, that hey, we're going to put that in there as a temporary, I think we get that past most of the money. The Department of Ed would not do that. I, I, no, I, I don't right. want to disagree with you. No. I'm just, <laughs> if we're going to put any money into it to bring it up, we need to make sure we do it the right way because the Department of Ed doesn't cut corners, uh, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I hear what Andy's saying, and I tend to agree with Mr. K. Lang, but let's, let's be real here. Um, that's kind of my thought process, too. <coughs> Um, with Mr. K. Lang's thought process, but I think if we're going to have this study done, let's do it the right way. Okay. See how we can get water and power up there. Okay. And, and in part of his study or report, is it going to give us some idea what it may cost? Didn't you say one time we may be able to pull power out of the cell phone tower? We have a conduit from from the um, the road to there. Yeah. So that's an option. Yeah. For well, no, we can, we can go from the pole to there, and then we get yeah. to go from there. Right. However, the, the rest of the way. way. Yeah. We just make them aware right. of that. And yeah. you said there's we can't go through the woods because there's. No, she she backed she backed off on that. Oh. She she, uh, she said it before, but this time I asked her about it. She said no, just you'd have to walk through there and then walk her through your your path. Who's this? Sarah. Uh, Sarah Lavelle. And who's she? Uh, Conservation. Or Conservation. Or Conservation. Definitely shorter than going down the road. Yep, take that whole corner off if you can come right through here. Yeah. Is that conservation concerns around potential wetlands, or is that conservation concerns around the rock formations? The formation will come up by itself when we dug the foundation people were there because we were developing the artifacts. Um, but we would just dug up someone else's farm foundation and we that some building that had been there. We still have that trough right next to it. What was that? There's still concrete troughs and frames of buildings in the middle of the woods out there. Uh -huh. By the barn there's a trough, so I'm not surprised they found foundation. Well, Gene Casey said it was his, his relatives that owned it. I was trying to describe that as a farm years ago. Mm. Okay. We good? Sure. All right. Tuesday the 18th at 3 o'clock. Sure. The board meeting at 5. Sure.
Um, well, this is um, Kobe suggested potentially reaching out to USDA World Development, and I don't have a lot of detail. That's okay. Department of Agriculture, Department of Justice, and the big thing he mentioned was the, he called it said the White House just released the school infrastructure package, which he was sending some... Unfortunately, that one, the application had to be submitted by May 18th of 24th. It's the one that I just saw. So. Okay. Okay, I would just, I'm going to, I'm going to search around. Yeah. If you're willing to take a picture of And the big takeaway I, I also got from that meeting with Colby was uh, his willingness to author support letters uh, right right as Michardi and Mr. Bianca constantly are submitting the skills capital the grants they require letters of support and sometimes it's a challenge to get those letters of support so they have a letter from the, the, the congressman, congressman's office that uh, would go along with so I think that was big for us Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. So be it. All in favor? I still don't have the.